Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight for our midweek Bible study. We are studying the book of Exodus. We are making our way through this book and we have been over the past several months. And tonight we are headed for Exodus chapter 37. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Exodus chapter 37. If you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch you can send me a message info at fourlakeschurch.org you can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274 but as i said tonight we are back to the book of exodus so god's people are now free from their slavery in egypt they are almost ready to leave mount sinai but before they do they're going to need to build the tabernacle and everything in it and this is pretty much where we are tonight they have collected a free will offering to provide the supplies and and if you remember, a week or so ago, we learned that Moses actually had to tell these people to stop giving. They had given too much. They had plenty of material to build the tabernacle. And so last week, we saw them build the tent itself. And tonight, we continue with the building of the furniture that is to be placed inside the tabernacle. And like last week, tonight's class will also be a little bit shorter than most. Uh, we are looking at the description of the guys building the furniture. So we're going to have the chief craftsman get started here and, and there may not be an abundance of practical application here so we're just moving on through this rather quickly all right so let's jump into it tonight with the first paragraph in exodus chapter 37 this is verses 1 through 9 exodus chapter 37 verses 1 through 9 now Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. Its length was two and a half cubits, and its width one and a half cubits, and its height one and a half cubits. And he overlaid it with pure gold inside and out, and made a gold molding for it all around. He cast four rings of gold for it on its four feet, even two rings on one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. He made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry it. He made a mercy seat of pure gold two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. He made two cherubim of gold. He made them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat, one cherub at the one end and one cherub at the other end. He made the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at the two ends. The cherubim had their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings, with their faces toward each other. The faces of the cherubim were toward the mercy seat. Well, once the tabernacle itself is put together, we now start into this chapter with the building of the Ark of the Covenant. And to be clear, there is a difference between the Ark of the Covenant and Noah's Ark. I think most of us understand that. But years ago, I remember hearing somebody object to the inspiration of the Bible by suggesting that there is no possible way that the Israelites could have carried an Ark 450 feet long, 75 feet wide by 45 feet tall through the wilderness for 40 years, that that would have been too heavy. And of course, that would have been too heavy. So that's not what's going on here. These are two different arcs. Uh, the word ark simply refers to a chest or a box of some kind, and the ark that we're dealing with here is roughly 45 inches long by 27 inches deep by 27 inches tall. So a little bit smaller than the table that we have at the front of our church facility here in Madison, or maybe as we've discussed before, kind of the uh, roughly the size of one of those extra large igloo type coolers that you might take on a fishing trip on a boat for a few days. So that's roughly at 45 long or from side to side, 20 27 tall by 27 deep. Well, they make this box out of wood, acacia wood. They cover it with gold, just as God had instructed a few chapters previously. And then they also make it with that system of rings and poles so that it could be carried without touching the box itself. And that, of course, is exactly as God had commanded. And this will be significant later in Scripture when we find that David tries to have the ark moved on a cart instead of by using the poles as it was designed so david failed to consult god on that and he got in trouble for it and you may remember a guy named uzzah dies in the process the oxen stumble uzzah reaches out to keep it from falling and god strikes him dead there on the spot and it doesn't seem fair if we just step into that story with no background until we realized that God had given them very specific instructions as for moving this uh, on top of the ark they create the mercy seat 
with the two cherubim, or I think a lot of us would uh, describe these creatures as angels with their wings spread out over the seat. And by the way, I didn't point this out when we studied that passage from uh, the end of the book of John a few weeks ago. Uh, but some have suggested a para uh, parallel between the cherubim over the ark <clears throat> and the two angels at each side of the place where the body of Jesus was laying in the tomb. And we didn't really have time to go into that in any great detail a few weeks ago. But if you remember when Mary looked inside the tomb, I think this, at least the second time, uh, she saw those two angels. Uh, with one sitting where Jesus' head had been and then one where his feet had been. And to me, you know, it's not pointed out in Scripture, but it just, uh, to me, it's an interesting parallel just to note that with the angel on each side. At least when I read that passage in John, what comes to my mind is the mercy seat with one angel on each side of it. So let's continue tonight with Exodus 37, verses 10 through 16, the next paragraph here. Exodus 37, verses 10 through 16. Then he made the table of acacia wood two cubits long and a cubit wide and one and a half cubits high. He overlaid it with pure gold and made a gold molding for it all around. He made a rim for it out of a hand. Uh, uh, he made a rim for it of a handbreadth all around and made a gold molding for its rim all around. He cast four gold rings for it and put the rings on the four corners that were on its four feet. Close by the rim were the rings, the holders for the poles to carry the table. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold to carry the table. He made the utensils which were on the table, its dishes and its pans and its bowls and its jars, with which to pour out drink offerings of pure gold. So we now move on to the table of showbread, which was basically, as we would describe it, a small side table. So it wasn't the main event, but it was there. Uh, to be used. It had a practical function, and we've got the dimensions here in cubits and in handbreadths. And the table is also constructed with these rings and poles for carrying it. And the whole thing is covered in gold, and then we also have the utensils as well. And we don't have the details here, but as I remember it, the table was to hold the fresh bread that was to be continually presented as an offering of sorts to the Lord. And for a tie-in to the New Covenant, I know I think about Jesus saying that he is the bread of life. And so if the old is a shadow of the new, then I think we realize that Jesus is the true bread. And this table of showbread is merely a shadow. It was foreshadowing something much greater that was to come, which of course ended up being Jesus. And of course we know that now. Uh, they, they just couldn't see the whole picture back then. So let's continue with Exodus 37. The next paragraph is verses 17 through 24. Exodus 37, 17 through 24. Then he made the lampstand of pure gold. He made the lampstand of hammered work. Its base and its shaft, its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers were of one piece with it. There were six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand from the one side of it and three branches of the lampstand from the other side of it. Three cups shaped like almond blossoms, a bulb and a flower in one branch, and three cups shaped like almond blossoms, a bulb and a flower on the other branch. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand, in the lampstand there were four cups shaped like almond blossoms, its bulbs and its flowers, and a bulb was under the first pair of branches coming out of it, and a bulb under the second pair of branches coming out of it, and a bulb under the third pair of branches coming out of it, for the six branches coming out of the lampstand. Their bulbs and their branches were of one piece with it. The whole of it was a single hammered work of pure gold. He made its seven lamps with its snuffers and its trays of pure gold. He made it and all its utensils from a talent of pure gold. Like the other items, we basically have a description of these people obeying the Lord and building the furniture for the tabernacle according to the instructions that God had given earlier. And so we won't go into this in any detail really at all, but we've got the lampstand consisting of the seven lamps, one in the middle, three on each side, finely crafted with hammered gold with the various parts patterned after almond blossoms and flowers. And, and making a connection, I guess, to the New Covenant again, let's remember how Jesus said that he was the light of the world. And so if Jesus is the true light, then this lesser light, in a sense, I think we would say is merely a shadow 
or kind of a fuzzy image of what would come later in Jesus. And of course, we appreciate Jesus, but they really didn't see him as uh, as, as coming. So they weren't able to, uh, to see that the way that we see him now. So let's conclude tonight the last little paragraph. This is Exodus 37, verses 25 through 29. Exodus 37, 25 through 29. Then he made the altar of incense of acacia wood, a cubit long and a cubit wide square, and two cubits high. Its horns were of one piece with it. He overlaid it with pure gold, its top and its sides all around, and its horns, and he made a gold molding for it all around. He made two golden rings for it under its molding on its two sides on opposite sides as holders for poles with which to carry it. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. And he made the holy anointing oil and the pure fragrant incense of spices the work of a perfumer. Well, we covered this just a few weeks ago, it seems, but the altar of incense was kept in the holy place and was apparently moved into the most holy place, perhaps on the Day of Atonement. That's kind of the best way we could harmonize the slight difference between what we find here in Exodus and what we find over in Hebrews. But in this passage, the altar of incense is constructed with wood. It's covered with gold like the other items. And it's also, like the other items, made with this system of rings and poles so that it could be carried without touching it. I think most of you know by now that I do quite a bit of camping, kind of a few weeks here and there at a time. And, and I've learned by experience that when it comes to living in a car for a couple weeks at a time, it is very important to have a system kind of for everything to have its place. You can't just be throwing stuff in there. But everything has to have a purpose. There's no wasted space when you're living in your car for a few weeks. A, a Subaru Crosstrek is not a large vehicle by any means. And so if I don't put stuff exactly where it goes, uh, life on the road has a way of getting complicated pretty quickly. And I just share this to emphasize that God has a system here, doesn't he? He's not asking for much. This is not you know, this overabundance just piles and piles of stuff to take around. But he does want his people to follow his instructions concerning the instruction and the uh, construction of the tabernacle and its furniture. And there's a reason for all of this, because they will, in fact, be traveling uh, for very, uh, uh, over a long distance, over a number of years. And as we discussed a few weeks ago, the connection to the New Covenant here with the altar of incense is that our prayers are described or pictured in the book of Revelation as ascending into God's throne room as incense. And so this is the shadow. Our prayers are the reality. They had actual incense. We don't use incense today in worship uh, because our prayers are the incense that ascends before God in heaven. And then at the end here, kind of throwing this in, they also make the anointing oil as well. So this brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 37. Uh, next week, we hope to cover Exodus 38, where they finished the construction of the tabernacle and its furniture, both inside and out. Uh, but thank you for joining us tonight. Again, if you have any comments or questions about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, if there's anything that we need to uh, be praying about, anything we can do to encourage you. Uh, if you have any feedback as to what we need to study next after the book of Exodus, we're getting near the end. So get in touch with me there as well, and uh, let me know if you have any ideas or suggestions. Send a text, give me a call, 608-224-0274, or send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. We would love to hear from you. Somebody made a comment uh, asking a really good question a few weeks ago on, uh, I think it was a comment on one of the videos, and I am not able to find it. And if you were the one who made that comment, I want to invite you to get back in touch with me again. I don't know if that got uh, caught up somewhere or disappeared or if you deleted that, but it was something about a verse in Isaiah being literal. And the question is, is it literal or is it to be taken symbolically? Something about uh, springing forth. I know there was water involved. So uh, let me know if that was you. I uh, didn't mean to ignore that, but I saw it and uh, might have been while I was on the road somewhere driving and I uh, didn't get back to it and I cannot find it. So if that's you, resend that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, but as we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God who rescued your people from the land of Egypt and you gave them the freedom to worship. You blessed them with time and skill and abundant resources and you gave them instruction in how to construct a place where they could come together and meet with you so that their sins could be covered by your grace and by your mercy. Today, Father, we know that you have done the same for us, but in a much better way. 
You sent your only son to purchase our freedom from sin, and you've covered us with your love and forgiveness. And in response, we praise you for your loving kindness. Thank you, Father, for loving us, and thank you for sending Jesus into this world. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.